Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, good morning, family. Awesome to worship uh, together. Uh, if you're a guest, uh, welcome on out. Uh, I just want to give a special shout out to our dear sister Benay. Awesome to have her here. We got Hector and Wendy with us as well. Amen. Great leaders over there uh, in our kids' class. Um, I, I do want to just lift the uh, male and the shade. Now they're both in ICCM. And uh, just special shout out to uh, Douglas and Monica so much. Thank you for an amazing, inspiring contribution message. Uh, it's also to see our dear sister in the faith who just got baptized last week, Tiffany. And uh, also Mr. Mayor himself, Jonathan Franklin. Today is his birthday. So let's make sure... Uh, you give them all the big hugs and tell them how much you love them and try to make them blush and cry. That's the goal today, amen? <laughs> well, let's get into the Bible. I do have a story real quick. There was a king once asked his daughter how dear he was to her. She replies, as dear, as dear, as salt, she said. The king was very dissatisfied with this child's answer thinking she did not love him enough. Not long after this, the king held this great feast. You got to imagine that for a second with all the food and the music and all the festivities. His daughter saw to it that every dish was brought to the table unsalted. Thus, nothing tasted good to the king. Maybe you could relate right here. No flavor on that chicken and no flavor on the, the sides right there. So nothing tasted good to this king or his guests. When he understood what had happened, he recognized the full importance of salt and realized the truth of his daughter's response. Thus he loved her again as dearly as before. What's the point of this whole story? Because they haven't lived without salt before. Salt is very essential. And the same is for you and I. Nothing we do can take us away from the love of God, right? right. However, for this, the, the father and her daughter, the father finally realized there's nothing that my daughter cannot do to take away her love for me. That's what he finally realized. He's like, oh, I don't know if my daughter loved me enough, but it dawned on him like, wait, she does. As dearly, dear as salt. So let's kind of talk about salt. I think Jesus talks a little bit about salt as well. We are here for uh, the Bible, amen? Yeah. And we're here to worship our mighty God, are we not? Yeah. Turn the Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 14. Here Jesus talks a little bit about salt as well. And uh, I think we got to get a little salty. It's time to get a little salty. Not the, not the salty that some of us can be with our attitudes. Not the type of salty we could be from the worldly standard, but the salt that God talks about here in Luke 14. Pick it up here in verse 31. It says, so suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit for neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. You gotta, Jesus is so cool. He's like, hey, whoever has ears, let them hear. Like, figure this out. You know, and obviously we know the context of here. Jesus was talking to the multitudes of people and the crowds of people who wanted to follow him. And there was a cost to that. And he, Jesus challenged him to give up everything. However, Jesus goes on and talks a little bit about salt here. And he begins talking about salt. And salt is used for all types of things. Obviously, it's used for flavor. However, historically, it was also used as a preservative. And it was also used as a fertilizer. So here's the scripture says that if the salt loses its saltiness, guess what? 
it has no more purpose. It becomes useless all of a sudden. In the context, Jesus is getting that because you got to think about their day and age. There's a lot of agricultural things going on. And we know the fertilizers were used to help the plants get stronger and to grow. However, in the context of manure pile, we should understand that good salt properties would spread along this manure pile and preserve it in the fertilizing properties of it to help the plant grow. Otherwise, the manure would rot or ferment and become useless as fertilizer. It would serve no longer any point. Therefore, unsalty salt is useless either as a fertilizer itself or as it even enhance the fertilizer properties. And so Jesus here is getting at with the people. It's like, hey, he's calling the people to give up everything, but also to what? To stay salty. To follow God and to remain faithful. To stay steadfast and to preserve the original convictions through the scriptures. Which brings me to the title of my lesson today, to stay salty. We need to stay salty. Some of us have too much salt. You may need to tone it down a little bit. But some you don't have enough salt. And it's, it is, it's leaving you right there uh, lacking some nutrients. So I want to talk about that and address that real quick. Especially if we're going to finish the year off strong. Because God's doing the great things here in Southland. I mean, Jonathan's birthday. <laughs> Tiffany got baptized. I mean, a lot of missionaries actually came from Southland and planted churches all around the world. God is doing incredible things. But if we're going to end this year off strong, we got to understand that we, too, need to have deep, salty convictions. And that's just two areas I want to focus on is commitment and understanding the spiritual battle at hand. Amen? Point number one, strength through commitment. Turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Strength through commitment. Obviously, this is during the king's period, and then you had good kings. And most of those good kings, majority of them would always devote themselves to God. And they would act justly. They would make sure that they are, are practicing what they're preaching. But also you had some, some not-so-good kings. And those not-so-good kings would pretty much be the opposite. They would not be close to God. And they would not administer justice for the people. Here, during the time of Asa, we pick it up here in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. And it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Let's just pause right there real quick. If you want to get strong, the Bible says get fully committed. Amen? Amen. So what's going to get you strong is just making a decision to be fully committed to the Lord. Don't play it safe. Don't play it safe. It's not the time to play it safe right now. Instead, put all the chips in. Put all the marbles in. Be all in and give your best to the Lord. Amen? God gives your full commitment. He calls us to do likewise. God gives us his best, and he calls us to do likewise. Look at Luke chapter 9. We're going to do a little Bible study today. Luke chapter 9, again, multitudes of people are following Jesus, and it's just so similar to, like, the religious society that we live in. A lot of times people want the, the, the benefits and the blessings of Christianity. Uh, or maybe they want to date just like Douglas and Monica and get married and be up here on the altar and be like, man, I do. A lot of people want the blessings of Christianity, but they don't want the blessings of it. Look at Luke chapter 9. We picked up here in verse 57. And it says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, he had it on straight. But once he said, but first, you don't want to be a but first person. He says, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Here Jesus lays it on out. He's like, hey, he's calling these guys to full commitment, nothing less. And it's interesting because every guy that Jesus was calling to the standard to follow him, they all had all types of excuse of why they couldn't follow him. 
One guy's like, hey, well, my family. Oh, one guy's like, hey, like, um, it's uncomfortable. I, I kind of want to fit in. I want to be accepted. I want to be accepted and be like the masses of the people around me here. And, and it made me think, too, like, well, in context, who were these guys Jesus was talking to? Who were they? Look at Matthew chapter 8. I'll tell you with a little Bible study. In today's service, as you guys know, it's a little different. Uh, today is also a little communion here. Because I think as things are, all these things are going on, it's so easy to get caught up in a whirlwind of things you can't control and jobs and the transitions and all these different stuff. And you can forget just the plain basics. Jesus called us to the plain basics, which is being fully committed. But who was he talking to in Matthew chapter 8? Pick it up here in verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told them, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Who was Jesus? Ref- he was talking to the religious society at this time that teaches the law, but also he was talking to his very own, those who call themselves disciples. And we see Jesus puts the relationship on a line. And he's like, dude, this is the standard still. Like, I love you this much, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to call you to the truth, to be fully committed, because that's the only way you're going to get stronger. And Jesus was serious about this commitment. I think that's why in Matthew 7, the people were so shocked of Jesus' teaching. And they realized the difference between the way Jesus taught and the religious societies. They're like in Matthew 7, 29, they understood that Jesus taught as one with authority, not as the teachers of the law. So what was the clear difference here? What was the difference between what Jesus taught and those who practiced the law, the religious society at this time? Well, Jesus actually expected them to obey him. You think just because we go to church and show up, like, the world is not doing the same thing right now on a Sunday? You see what I'm saying? You don't think just because we pray and we read our Bibles, like, someone else around the corner literally is doing the exact same thing? The difference that made Jesus' teaching so different is that he expected them to obey him. And Jesus actually expected commitment. He expected commitment from those who said they're going to be his disciples. So what did that mean for the church that was going to be called themselves a church full of disciples? I'm glad you asked. Not my words, but let's go to the Bible. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Strength through commitment. What got these guys that once were Jews, what got them strong in their walk with God? Because they have to give all of that up. You think about that sometimes? Their whole entire life, it was one way of how to worship God. Now all of a sudden, they're shown that it was all kind of like wrong now, in a sense. And now all of a sudden, they're called to follow this guy who just literally just died on the cross. (laughs) Man, that's life-changing right there. But look how these guys respond in Acts chapter 2. And we pick it up here in verse 41. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, not someone. Maybe, maybe just Paul was filled with awe and many wonders. Maybe it was just Kim. Maybe it was just J.L. Maybe it was just Walt. I don't, maybe it was just Jonathan Franklin because it's his birthday. No, it says, it says everyone was filled with awe at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They, meaning everyone, sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And so it's awesome to see Douglas and Monica come up here like, man, guys, because of you guys' rich generosity, guess what? We're recipients of it. You took care of our needs. You took care of the needs of the sister who's dealing with all this abuse, even as a disciple, that she got go to a, a place of refuge, which is a sister's household, and actually stay faithful. And now she's like the right hand, like sister to the ministry out there. Because they took care of each other and they were actually family. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God. That's what we come to church for, to praise God. 
in the joy and the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why? Because they were fully committed. God blessed it. God blessed the fully committed church. And God grew it. And it says every day they met together. And, you know, me and a brother was joking about this. Like, we have a long way to get to this point. It said that they met each other and met up with each other every single day. I think some of us could even struggle in this room. They even come out to um, a middle of the week type of service for two hours. But your job calls you to, to be committed eight hours, and we don't have no problem missing that, right? But just two hours for our own salvation and for us to stay faithful, and you get the spiritual help that you need. And so, like, I don't know, guys. What were they devoted to? It says from the scriptures they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. These guys didn't just make something up. They're actually, they, they, they talk about the scriptures here, right? They were devoted to the Bible. They all knew it. Fellowship. They were actually family. It wasn't something they just put on a bumper sticker. They actually were family. And guess what? They were so family so much that when people from the outside came in, they were impacted by it. That's how they were one in the favor of all the, all the people. Like, they came in and was like, wow, this is amazing. I never see any type of fellowship like this. Breaking the bread, it means to, like communion with God. They remembered the cross. They remembered their why. Do we remember our why? And prayer, obviously, their devotional life to God. Every day they did this. This was the church. This is the church out there accepting that message. This is the church. This is how we you and I got here. <laughs> <laughs> And so for us, like, for us, what makes us different as a church in the 21st century? It's not that we just show up and go to church and sit in the pews. It's not. It's that we actually expect everyone who's going to call themselves disciples in this church to live like disciples. (laughs) Simple as that. As it says in 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. There's no wiggle room. However, we all come into church jacked up, though. But here's the thing. You can be jacked up, but you got to be committed. You just cannot be jacked up and uncommitted, amen? The reason why you got to be committed because you're trying to put the Bible into practice. And guess what? Thank God we have a family that loves you enough and will do that for you, amen? We'll look out for each other. We'll meet those needs, and whether it's on a foreign mission field or even locally here in L.A. Because we're truly a family. But let me ask some of you, how's that going for you this morning? How's it going for you with worship? Like, it's sad to say, I'm going to speak to the brothers real quick, that your appointed shepherd has to talk to you just to move up closely to be family during a midweek service. And, like, ask you, like, repeat, like, guys, come on. He was gentle about it. Then after a while, he's like, and no one still moved. How's that going for you? Just attending meetings of the body, which is only, what, like about two hours? Let's do it. Let's do the math on this, logically. Two hours expected for you from Sunday service. Two hours maybe on Wednesday. If you're a campus student, if you're a campus student, maybe another two hours. What's that? Six hours? In Bible talk, what, 30 minutes? Maybe potentially like a devotional on a monthly basis? And it's hard to commit to that? But your job expects so much from you? so demanding, and you don't complain whatsoever, but your salvation depends on this right here, and you can't ever bring the check with you to heaven? Guys, we got it all backwards. We got it backwards. I got to ask you, how's it going with just confessing your sins? Being your brothers and sisters keeper, like, I believe, like, you know, I, I love the sisters, but how, how often do we check up on one another? How often do you check up on your leaders, your Bible talk leaders? Like, I think we ask so much from our leaders, and it's like, take, take, take. But when do we start giving back to them? Like, they're human too. We talked about this uh, with the transitions. Like, people are uprooting their lives. And some of them struggle with that because they're human, but they understood, like, hey, I made a decision to become a disciple. I'm going to give this up so I can go fight for my family. We need to lift up their arms, amen? All I'm seeing is... For some of us in this room, we got to make a decision to be fully committed. As a church, what do we believe in? Well, we believe that we're a Bible church, not just a New Testament church. Some people are like, well, the New Testament, the Old Testament, I don't really appreciate. Nah, we believe in it at all. Right? We believe that the, the, the church 
is built off the entire Bible, old and new. We can still take biblical principles from the Old Testament. You know, we ain't going to be up here chopping off no goats and throwing blood everywhere. That'd be kind of weird. What was the whole point of Jesus dying on the cross if that was the case, right? We understand Jesus was the, the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Now we get to be in part of his new covenant. But guess what? It's still his word, and it still applies for us today. You could draw so much meaning from the Old Testament. I mean, Moses going, freeing the Israelites out of slavery, crossing the, 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 the Red Sea, which to represent what? Baptism. Going over to the, 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 the desert, which some people think that it was like the promised land. No, it wasn't the promised land. It was the Christian life. Yeah. It was running in this desert. They were tested in the Christian life. Oftentimes people get saved and you think like, okay, I'm good. No. You, you got to stay faithful. You got to be fully committed. And then what's happening after that? Then they crossed the Jordan, which still represent death. Then they got to the promised land. And it was an inheritance for them as well, amen. What else do we believe as a church? The church is only composed of baptized disciples and discipling relationships. Why is that the case? Acts 2 teaches. It says everyone, did it not? Was it like, oh, well, I, I just want to say a prayer this time. You can get baptized. I'm going I'm to pray. It doesn't say that. Jesus taught specifically on what it meant to be saved. And so as a church, we believe in the Bible. And so we believe that the Bible teaches very clearly that only baptized disciples are saved. But how do you keep those disciples faithful? Well, Matthew 28 tells you what. It's two parts. You make them a disciple, baptize them. Then what? Teach them to obey everything. Thank God we're a family that actually takes that very serious. Amen? Amen. What else we, 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 do we believe? We believe where the Bible speaks, we're silent. And where the Bible is silent, we speak. What that mean? If the Bible says it, end of the discussion. That's it. I ain't argue, you argue, you'll find yourself arguing with God here. Yeah. However, if the Bible doesn't say it, that doesn't mean like, okay, everything out the window, I'm just going to do whatever I want. No, 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 no. We still got to be godly. However, you can take biblical principles from the Bible that doesn't contradict the Bible, and you can utilize it to build up the kingdom, take care of the church's needs. For example, we have these discussions every single week called Bible Talk. You would not see the word Bible in the Bible. Does that mean just toss this out the window? You know what I mean? Like, no. So you can take biblical principles and apply it to make the church um, built up and, and, and for God in a great way. Amen. What else do we believe? We believe in evangelization of the world in our generation. I think the GNN was a great visual and testament to that. That we're not just a church that's just talking about it. We're a church that's actually trying to build the walls of Christianity all around the world so people can have what you and I have, salvation, amen? And it wasn't just in the, the generation of the disciples. It's even called for our generation. The thing is, what makes a generation? How many of us out of show of hands know your great-great-grandfather or grandmother? Okay. How many of us, out of show of hands, know your great grandmother or grandfather? That's part of your generation, right? How many of you guys know your mom or dad? That's still your generation. How many of us with kids that's still alive? That's part of your generation. How many of us with kids with kids that's still alive? That's part of your generation. You see what I'm saying? So anything, obviously, that's part past that or under that, that is still not alive in your day and age and your generation, that's a different generation. However, the Bible calls within your generation, it's our goal as disciples to go help them become disciples because that's what the Bible calls us to do, amen? And we also believe in centralized leadership with the centralized leader. Ooh, this is where it gets scary for people because we believe in authority. Sadly, we, we got to be honest, like the U.S. was built off rebellion. <laughs> We celebrate every year on 4th of July, fireworks, rebellion. But I think it's in the U.S. DNA to a degree. And don't get me wrong, I get it. I get the sentiment because some people abuse their authority. It's in the Bible. You have so many people abusing their authority, different kings, like, hammering it out with people and just wickedly just abusing people. And that's not okay. That's not cool. I'm not promoting that. However, the Bible is clear about authority. And the Bible, we believe from the scriptures that God always had a men, a centralized leader with centralized leadership. Make it simple. Think about Moses. Moses, who was God's man. Moses, everyone knows the story of Moses. He led the people because he was God's man. And he didn't do it alone. He, and, you know, with some good wisdom and advice, orchestrated a great structure that helped take care of the needs 
of that movement at the time, the nation of God, right? However, you see a lot of people even from the, um, the, the, the world, the secular world, even tying and pulling from these principles. Think about it, in, in all these major corporations, they have a hierarchy as well, a structure. You have the CEO, the vice president, all these different things. Why? To take care of the needs of the company. Not everybody can just make a call to the CEO like, hey, man, I need a raise. Hey, man, when's my day off? You know what I mean? Like, so in order to take care of the needs of this structure and this business, they use that principle from the Bible. It shows you how powerful the Bible is, even to pagans, amen. <laughs> but guess what? We believe in the same thing. We believe from the scripture that God appoints a man. And for us, it's Kip McKean. And some people could have like, well, he don't look like me. Well, amen, bro. Like, that's God's man. <laughs> and Kip, he doesn't do it alone. He has a, a, a structure of people that disciple him and help him. And, and then it goes down to the world sector leaders. And the world sector leaders have their geographic areas of activity that they oversee to help make sure the needs. And it trickles all the way down to the L.A. church. And then the L.A. church trickles all the way down to regional. And then it, tri- and it keeps and it keeps and it keeps going until it gets to you and I on an individual uh, basis. But how comforting is that? I think sometimes we can think control is a bad thing. Try talking to the mom at the grocery store and trying to calm down her kid. Like, the kid is like, ah, ah, and everybody's in line like, you better get your kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> no one's going to be like, no one's going to be like, man, you're doing a great job, mom. Keep it up. Like, no. So control is a good thing. I think we just got to untie, unplug ourselves from this religious society and being American and actually do the Bible. Are you with me? Why is this so important? It actually keeps the church a safe place. So when anyone, because of sin, right, if anyone starts to act up, guess what? We jump on it swift, swift. We got shepherds who are really ready to make sure they're taking care of God's church. Why? Because you gotta, you got to keep it a, a, a safe place. We have Bible talk leaders ready, knowing their scriptures, to make sure the church needs to stay a safe place. It's the reason why people could come in and be like, man, that's the church I was baptized into. It's the reason why people could come and be like, man, this church is, they're not just talking about it, but they're actually living out the Bible. I want to be a part of that. And a girl just did that last week. It was Tiffany. Let's look at a guy who had this level of commitment and put the relationship on the line. Look at John chapter 6. I just want to teach us a little bit. I think we just got to get, get a conviction in this area. In John 6, verse uh, 60. And it says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Or word that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you. I told you, man. I told you. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And the church said, Amen. Man, Jesus put the relationship on the line again. He wasn't compromised because it was the truth. And Jesus knew he's God. He knows all things. The only way that was actually going to help people was not to back off and not to compromise the standard, but call people to the standard. And so Jesus, like, even tells his guys, the 12, the apostles, the guys he appointed, like, you want to leave too, do you? And Peter's like, I mean, dang. I mean, where, where would I go? I gave up everything to follow you. Because I came to know and to believe. He had his own convictions. I came to know and believe that you're the Holy One of God. Deep convictions. If you want to get stronger, get fully committed. Amen. Amen. You know, I want to share a little bit about my life a little. Um, I share my story from time to time. But this is easy to talk about. It's easy to preach about. It's another thing going through it. You know what I'm saying? Because here's the thing. God's going to test it. 
And I remember just studying the Bible. I grew up uh, going to church a lot. Uh, I was a deacon, grew up very religious. But it came a point in my life when I was 25 working in a, in a workforce, and I was like, just tired of life. Honestly, I was like, if this is what life is all about, I don't want no part of it. I, w- I want to get right with God. So I started studying the Bible. And for me, upbringing, like, my family was, like, everything. Coming from a tight-knit family, from the projects and every like, we looked out for each other. If we had to cut corners just to make sure food is on the table, that's what we did. We were trying to survive. We were in survival mode, you know what I mean? And so growing up, I was always attached to that. If it's a family event, I'm there. If it's a, if it's a birthday, I'm there. Uh, anything. I'll do anything. Go, go anywhere. Do, give up anything for my family. And so when I was studying the Bible, one of the calls I, I clearly start to see is like, man, from the scriptures we even just looked at, Jesus was calling people to put God above your family. And I was like, man, okay, I, I'm willing to do it. Let's go. God tested. When I was studying the Bible, actually, uh, one of my biggest persecutors, persecution is just like opposition. You take a stand for something, right? It's, it's just an oppose. Um, was my mom. And as a mom, like, you know, growing up in that environment, like, she didn't really quite understand why I was making the decision I was making because even for herself, she, she knows about the Bible and not really know about the Bible, right? And so she started to get, like, um, overreact. She started to overreact in an emotional way. And I'm not knocking her. She's my mom. She has every right to feel her concern. However, me studying the Bible, I've seen a different kind of truth to this matter, if you will. I was like, man, I'm not right with God. I need to do everything possible to make that change and get right with God. And so my mom blowing up my phone the day of my baptism, and she's, she overreacts, and she's calling up my pastor. Pastor, you know. So the pastor calls me while I'm at work, and um, I get this text, and he's like, oh, man, um, I hope it's not the, the ICOC, which is the International uh, Churches of Christ, or the ICC, which is the International Christian Church, our fellowship. It's a cult. Now, I'm black. <laughs> You know, and uh, sometimes the things are kind of off. It's like, you see one person run, we all run and we'll ask questions later. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just saying, culturally. And so I'm like, wait, what? Like, how deep am I into this? Like, what the heck? Like, I'm kind of mad, but kind of like afraid at the same time. And um, I kind of panic. And I was like, you know what? I just, I'm going home. So I'm emailing my manager. And, um, and then I check online. I'm like, oh, like, it's some good reviews of, of what's going on with the church, but also some negative stuff that people just didn't really know the Bible very well, and they had a lot to say. And it's, it's interesting. It's always the people that have something to say is the ones that really be in their Bible. You know what I mean? Um, and I was like, wait. I was like, wait, like, we, we, I learned this. This, this is what the Bible talks about. Not everyone's going to agree with me, and that's okay. Like, but I got to follow God here. My persecution led all the way up into my baptism. Like, me in the waters of baptism, about to get ready to to get dunked into the water, fully submerged, that's what we believe in, baptismal, um, it was still persecution. And I remember just that night just crying because there was so much commercial. Even in the church we got, I got baptized in, um, the whole church came, my whole family came, trying to talk me out of this situation that that I made a decision on personally because the scriptures. And I'm like, wow, this is real. It freaked me out. But now, seven years later, I can still stand because of that decision, amen? <laughs> Just like Peter. And obviously, it didn't even stop there. Sadly, even after the baptism, friends walked away. The guy that helped me become a Christian was a part of my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He walked away. The, the other girl I was close to in a, in, a, in a church because we knew each other from the secular world or whatever, she walked away. And now it's like all these close relationships I have that's within the church, they're all gone. And just like Peter, I had to dig deep. Like, where, where would I go? I come to know and believe that you're the Holy One of God. And that has to be our convictions as well, amen? We just can't seek the kingdom and not his righteousness. The Bible says seek his kingdom in his righteousness, amen? And so this is the same stance that Kip took a while back. It's the reason why we still have a church to this day. It's the reason why God is blessing this church. You've seen the Good News Network. Now in 2022, a church is over 15,000 disciples all around the world because of people not compromising in their convictions. You know, I want to challenge us to make a decision to be fully committed, 
simply. Here's the thing. We always talk about this. You got to be willing to do anything, bro, and go anywhere and to, to give up anything, right? I want to challenge you. Do it. Actually do it. That was the difference between what Jesus taught and what the religious world said. Like, Jesus expected you to obey. That was being a disciple. So here's the practical, right? If you're asked to give things up that's hurting your walk with God, give it up if you're going to be a disciple. If you're asked to do anything and to ask to help, to serve, meet a need, go, go take communion to a brother that's shut in, whatever it may be, do it and do it cheerfully. And if you're asked to go anywhere and a, and a spirit decides to put you on that mission team to Apio Samoa, or, or the, 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 the spirit decides to blow you back to San Francisco or whatever in the region of L.A., be willing to do it. Let us be all salty in our commitment, amen? As I get ready to close out, point number two, spiritual warfare. I think this is just important. Revelations chapter 12. I told you I got a little study. It's just a, a message that's on my heart. Point number two, spiritual warfare. Revelation 12, I'll just jump right into it in verse 7. It says, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, praise God, and by the word of the testimony, praise God. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When a dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she could be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening his mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to rage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Spiritual warfare. The Bible is very clear that this is this cosmic battle that's going on even right now as I speak. And it's not this physical battle that's going on against flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual one. This forces of light versus darkness, good versus evil, Satan versus God. And let me tell you something. Can I just be blunt with you guys? Yeah. Satan is not your friend. Stop petting him. As if he's like that dragon on the Chronicles of Narnia or something like that. Like he's your friend or something, right? He's not your friend. He actually hates you. He actually is ticked off at the fact that you have the audacity to be in his dominion in L.A. Where the city is influenced by entertainment that he has control over. Social media is so big that it has a ripple effect on the rest of the world. And he's leading the world astray. And you have the audacity to gather and worship God in his dominion. He's ticked off. He doesn't care about your age, whether you're a teen. He wants to send you to hell if he could right now. He doesn't care if you're, if you're aging and you're starting to get in a lot of pain. He don't care. He still wants to send you to hell right now. And I think for a lot of us, we can fall deceived by Satan's traps. We can start to believe that lie. That, that lie, like, hey, you can't be fruitful, Southland. You, you can't make a difference. You can't make an impact. Your marriage cannot get better. You cannot overcome impurity. You cannot blow out your mission. The couple that came up here, just forget about it. You're not good enough. You will not be good enough. And many of us in this room believe that lie. Time in and time out. Time in and time out. 
And you just keep hitting your head against the wall like as if anything's going to change because you're not relying on God. And then your lifestyle starts to display it. And it's a word called lukewarmness. Is this church the same glorious church that you were baptized in years ago? And a lot of us act like we're like, we're, we're creating more problems than actually being the solution, to be honest. And Jesus is like, dude, focus. Understand, tap into this. It's a war going on. Wake up. Wake up. And Satan is like, this is awesome. Got him exactly where I want him. It's almost like when people put a frog and they try to cook a frog. They're like, just don't turn it up hot. Nah, just, just gradually. Let it be subtle. Let it be subtle. Then the, the, fro- the frog is just chilling like, man, this is nice. This is really nice. Like, really nice. And as you know, the heat is at a, a level the frog can't even jump out of because now everything is just, like, deactivated. And the frog is safe. It cannot be the same for your faith this morning. However, I do believe there's some in this room that's fighting that good fight, though. And fighting every single day for your brothers and sisters to the right and left of you. Because you know, like, you and I know that, like, man, I, I want to get this ministry back going to where the glory days was. I want to see God work in my marriage. I want to see God work in my life. And you're fighting every single day because you're tuned in, because you understand it's a war. That you're righteous, that you're a victim because you're fighting with God's army. And what it does in a church or what it can do is that you start to have a group of people acting one way and another group of people acting one way. And it can become at odds at each other, to be honest. And it creates chaos. And Satan's like, this is awesome. There's no unity. No one's not on the same page. They're missing each other in communication. Like someone says something, they pass it down, and no one cares. This is awesome. How do we fight back? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How do we fight back? In verse 3 it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul says, fight back. Wake up. It's a spiritual war. And he says, hey, don't fight like the world. Don't, don't, don't be worldly about fighting back. Don't start getting angry at people. Don't start cursing people out. Don't start pulling back your heart. Don't stop giving. It says, fight back with the Bible. And oftentimes, if people can't fight back with the Bible, it just shows you where you're at. You don't know your Bible well. But here's the thing. That's okay. Because faith comes from hearing the word. You just need to get in your Bible more. Amen? To empower yourself. Because the flaming arrows are coming. And it says in the scriptures, it says, he has the power, meaning the scriptures, it has the power to demolish strongholds. It has, it, it demolish every argument. Demolish every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What is pretension? Well, it's just a false or unsupporting claim, the act of pretending, right? So we can think that our way of thinking is right, but it can actually be against God. So we can think that we're right, but really it's against God's way of thinking. That's why he says, my thoughts are what? Not your thoughts. My ways are what? Not your ways. We can think of ourselves as smarter, more sophisticated, more effective, more powerful than God's ways, which are which is just very foolish. We could be like, well... I got this accolades and this number of years, and, and, and God's like, so what? Solomon thought the same thing, dude. Look what happened to him. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because we could think our ways is better. And then Paul goes on and kind of address some more issues, but really what he's getting at here is like, it's a spiritual war. And then he talks about, hey, don't, don't judge based on mere appearance, because like these guys question Paul's authority. And they start to like, hey, like, this guy don't know what he's talking about. He's really bold in his letters. And his text messages in our day and age, like, he's really bold. He ain't bold in person. He's very inappressive. Can't even speak properly. Moses couldn't speak properly. You know what the Bible said about him? He was a powerful preacher. You see what I'm saying? He understood 
who he was. Same thing with Paul. Paul's like, hey, you, you judge it by mere appearances. Like, dude, you have a worldly point of view. You get nothing because you're tuned out right now. You know, scholars actually believe that Paul wasn't on an on a outside looking in, like, if based on looks, he wasn't very impressive. Like, we think of Paul, like, man, he wrote majority of the New Testament. This guy was, ah, you right? Like, for some reason, our worldly thing is like, this guy was like the LeBron James of the Bible. <laughs> Second to Jesus right here, you know? But really, scholars believe, um, you know, writings in the 200s, it says, Paul was a man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs. In a good state of body with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat kind of hooked. So Paul was described as a guy with a unibrow. <laughs> but here's the thing. Paul understood the authority that was given to him in Christ to build up the church, not tear it down. And people questioned that. He's like, all right, you want the tough Paul? I'll bring you the tough Paul. And he, and he switched gears on him, right? And so I think for us, in the same way, like, we could be so out of touch. We could be so out of touch with the, the, the person that God put in our life that's trying to help us and help us mature. And we could be like, I don't know, listen to what I want to listen to. My way is better. I've been doing this. And you could lose the, the, the heart of a child, which is constantly learning the things that God is trying to teach you. You should never get to a place where you feel like you know it all. That's dangerous. You should always, that's why Paul, the same guy that was unimpressed, he's like, I just want to know Christ. He knew a lot. Dude, this guy was very scholarly. He knew the whole law. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but he wanted to know more. He wanted to constantly learn more about God. Is that our heart today? You know, this is a difference. You know, I want to kind of share this illustration. And I want us to decide what type of church we want to be. An aircraft carrier or a cruise ship. And I love RD always hit on this, right? But there's, a, there's some similarities, but there's a clear difference as well. You know, they both have about 6,000 people on the ship. In an aircraft carrier, every single person is a vessel. Every single person has a role from the captain, like the leader, all the way down. Everyone is serving. Everyone is flat committed to what's at hand because they invested. They're plugged in. On a cruise ship, however, you have a few people who have a role, and they're doing all the work. And it's like, well, I'm, that's the waiter's job, you know, like, it's trash on the floor, but that's the waiter's job, you know, and, and you got everybody else scrambling, like, with, like a chicken with their head cut off, while everyone else is just civilized, and just looking from afar and enjoying their, their cruise. Like, man, this is awesome. And you got to ask yourself, what type of ministry you want to be, the aircraft carrier or the cruise ship? Do you want to be the cruise ship where it's like, you know what? I want Paul and Kim to take care of all the problems. Paul and Kim, Paul and Kim, Paul and Kim, Paul and Kim. You know what I mean? Like, they're just only one couple. They can't do it all, though, and they can't do it alone. We got to activate our shepherds. Our shepherds are training. You're there for a reason. Have the God given authority that God has instituted to you. Like, if God's calling you to be a shepherd to train in, that means He believes in you. Now just go do the work. If you're a Bible talk leader, like, well, you know, Tyree sent this text, and no. Like, own your flock, own your sheep. You should know who's here today and who's not. And if you don't, shame on you. Shame on you. Are you tuned in? Dude, it's a war right now. And we cannot afford too many casualties. We can't afford another loss. So it's time for us to actually wake up. Amen. <laughs> However, I believe in my heart, I believe that we are aircraft carriers. And I believe there's a lot of people are fighting for each other day in and day out, praying on their knees to their knees get ashy. You ever did that? You pray so much, your knees start getting ashy and it's like tired and sore, you know, and start hurting. Like I believe there's people in the room that's like that. That's, that's begging God and praying for the leadership. Sometimes the leaders need your prayer. They don't have it all figured out. And the leaders are, guess what, praying for their people because you don't have it all figured out. And everyone playing a role together because we are truly a family. Here's the crazy thing. When it actually comes into war physically, many countries understand this concept, the total investment that's needed to actually win a war. 
You know, facts show that in World War I and World War II, there were, there were war bonds. And war bonds had been sold to finance the American involvement in these wars. And it required the government to borrow amounts of money, large amounts of money. And over the course of the war, it says 85 million Americans purchased bonds worth a total of more than $180 billion. Think about that. U.S. PIMP may not be the U.S. you see today if it wasn't for the investment and people fighting for the, your lives today. To protect you. This is the reason why you could like meet here, get the Bible out without people shooting you up, to be honest. Because people were willing to be all in, understand there was a war going on, and they fought for their families to protect you and I. And it makes me think like, well, how much more the spiritual family of God? Like, is it too much for the church to ask you to give back in return? Because it gave you everything. It gave you salvation. It helped you when you needed benevolence. Forgot about that. It helped you. It was like, man, my marriage. Yeah. Guess who was there? Your church, your family, your spiritual family. It helped you when you were, like, ready to walk away. Guess who was there? Your brothers and sisters. Is it too much for the church or even me as your leader to ask for a little back in return? Ooh. It just shows you. If, it's, if, it, if, you, if you struggle with that, it shows you clearly where you're at. You're not plugged in right now. You're not plugged in. And so as a region, we have a need. We have a goal. To be honest, $67,385. That's our deed. Mind you, a couple of weeks ago, it was around $69,000. Does that mean we gave a lot? No. I think it, it, it means that people, that families are plugged in, were willing to help share that load with us. Thank God for Ventura region with the, the, the Joneses. Thank God for the, the recently planted Santa Barbara mission team that was like, you know what? Hey, we're family. Let's help Southland. But Southland helped them back in spring. But guess what? Now we're in a position of needing help. So we have a decision. Are we going to knock this thing out or what? The thing is, I want to challenge this today. Because we, we can't forget, like, well, maybe Jesus was kind of soft. Nah, like, we, it wasn't just the Jesus petting the lambs. You see what I'm saying? We got to understand, Jesus always stayed on the offensive because he was plugged into the war. Look at this last scripture in Luke 13. Because it points back to the cross. In Luke 13, it points back to the cross. And I just want to challenge us to fight back. Simply, fight back, go win a lost world. Don't just talk about it, do it. Set up a new study this week. Nothing's stopping you. Nothing's stopping you from knocking out your mission right now. Some of you guys have the means to do it. I'm hearing a lot of people traveling, and I'm not knocking that. Do it if you budget properly. But, like, it's a war right now. Casualties are dying. People in this congregation kind of struggling right now. They want to walk away. Let's get tuned in. Let's fight back. Let's raise the money that we need and knock out this mission to take care of those needs. Amen. Like, I want to put it before the region. Within the next two weeks, which, this, which means at the end of the month, let's get at least 50% as a region. What that's going to require, you today giving at least $140. This week as well as next. If you can't give it today, double up next week in regards to missions. Separated from content. It's separate. But it's all going to the same, obviously, cause. But it's just different needs. But I want to challenge us with this last scripture because this is Jesus' mindset. He understood it was a war. Luke 13. And we pick it up here in verse 31. And it says, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, you go tell that fox I will keep driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Southland, let this be our heart. Let's imitate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's continue to be committed fully, wholehearted devotion so we can get stronger and stronger in our walk with God. So we can be stronger and stronger for each other. So we can win a lost and dying world. And let's make the decision to be in tune to the spiritual world by doing whatever it takes, going anywhere, giving up everything to win a lost world. With that, I love you. Thank you so much.